in, um, in Norway. Um, and the snow is great. It's not, I, mean, I know it's not, at the moment, it's not wonderful snow, but it's, it's still, for me, it's snow, so it's exciting. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about um, understanding risk. Uh, I've got this odd job, I'm Winton Professor for the Public Understanding of Risk. I, I'm, I'm completely philanthropically funded. Winton is a hedge fund, and so they, uh, the billionaire head of this hedge fund gives us money to uh, sort of improve the way that risks and statistics and numbers are used in society. So a lot of my talk is going to be about media, um, presentation, it's all going to be about communication, um, but he's recently given us a whole lot more money, so we've actually got a whole centre now, Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence, I mean, that's the maths department in Cambridge, best maths department in the world, <laughs> and, um, and this little gang is in the basement, and it's strange because out of these people, four of them are full-time psychologists, two are ex-BBC communications people, one statistician, one web person, we're getting another web person now. So that's the sort of team Although we're in a maths department, work is all psycho. It's really, it's, it's psychologically driven. And the, the uh, I'm going to talk about uh, communication really at a public health level mainly. But actually, a lot of our work is much more at the sort of not just at, at um, we don't just work on medical things, but but that is an actual application. Is at the clinical level, at, at designing uh, materials for patients to use or doctors to use. And it's all based on this idea of user-centered design. So um, our psychologists and web designers work with the, who are the audiences for the websites or the materials, constantly iterating, rapid prototyping, changing designs in response to requirements. And so, for example, one of the things we're working on at the moment is a new front end for uh, what's called NHS Predict, which is a system used by tens of thousands of women a month or, or oncologists a month for uh, looking up alternative treatments for women newly diagnosed with breast cancer. And so, um, so for example, um, that's uh, part of a new front end, um, <laughs> which looks at survival for a woman uh, after surgery, uh, the actual survival curve, you know, with the extra benefits in terms of the probability of surviving as, uh, 10 years, in terms of these different you know, hormone therapy, chemotherapy, um, perceptin going up to here, with this is the sort of level at which if you were completely cured, it's a survival you would expect. So this is the showing of taking up the slack up to there. Now that's survival curves, that's quite a, a complicated, intricate thing. However, we've done randomized trials um, to show that many people, not everybody, with good labeling can understand survival curves. But the crucial thing is what we've learned from Sarah and others is that, as I'm going to mention, one size doesn't fit all. So in fact, you can choose to have the results as a table, as curves, as, as bar charts, in text, and as little icons, little dots. So you can choose the representation you want. And we found already in our testing that different people have very different choices. They're quite surprising what the patient's like. A table, of course, is a lovely thing. A table is a work of art. But it should be considered as a, as a graphic a good table. It's not a table. So, um, so that's, that's the kind of thing we do. And similarly, another project is to redesign um, feedback on genomic tests, which currently look like this. It's a completely awful, just dreadful way of communicating. And we've taken something like that and redesigned it to look like that, which directly answers the questions the patient wants to know what this result means, what you can do, where you can get more information and support, and all the junk is put on the back page. So you don't have to see it. So that's all done as an iterative process with patients, etc. So that's the kind of thing we're working on at a clinical level. What about the public health stuff? Now this is much more to do with risk stories. I'm going to drive this, the motivation for this. There's a lot of risk stories in the news. So I, I gave a talk at a breast cancer conference last week, and just clicking, I found stories, you know, just, this is just two weeks ago, or something, <laughs> sausages and breast cancer, and then we got night shifts and breast cancer from January the 8th, and then we got uh, Damame beans saving you from breast cancer, you know, you know this sort of stuff. You know, any day there'll be a stream of stories of good or bad quality about how um, things can help our, our health, you know, our exposures. <clears throat> and well, I, I'm a statistician, and what I'm really interested in is how do we come to hear this stuff? What's the process by which we, as the public, as you know, your customers essentially, um, get to hear about stuff? And I consider this a sort of pipeline. And the, the point is that you know, people say, oh, it's the media. That's just far too simple to say it's the media. Actually, I think the science journalists tend to be actually rather good, the actual journalists. You know, a lot, I work with them a lot. The actual journalists, it's, I think a lot of the problems occur in terms of distortions elsewhere in, the, in this pipeline from the, the work that they've actually done 
you know, you can do scientific research, it goes through scientific publications, but then it gets to the press offices, and the press releases start being written, then it goes to the media, and then finally we see it as the punters down at the end. And similarly, you know, um, when you've got policymakers or NGOs, they're commissioning research or, or institutes of public health, etc., and then passing it through their own comms departments, whatever, blah, 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 and off it goes, and we, and we eventually see it. Um, there are bypasses. Now, social media allow you to bypass some of these traditional principles. But that's basically these processes. And at each of these stages, problems can occur. And so, for example, I'm interested in the power of the press release. There's a lot of, there's a lot of academic work being done now on the, what are, uh, the role of the press release and how many distortions. I won't go into it, but there's been papers in the British Medical Journal showing that the majority of misunderstandings that arise in the uh, media coverage of, of st health stories have been present in the press release. The press release has been a lot of problem. So this is a lovely example. This is um, a typical boring Swedish study. And uh, so th this was um, you know, the usual thing, four million people showing that um, we observe consistent associations between higher socioeconomic position and higher risk of glioma. Richer men get slightly more brain tumors. Okay, so that's the story. And then they said that, though that could very well be taught before because richer people um, have better health care, they're more likely to be diagnosed, they're more likely to get on the registry. So it could be a complete artifact. So they said that. Then it goes to the press office, who thought, well, that's not very interesting. Let's make it that high levels of education are linked to heightened brain tumor risk. <laughs> Which is not what the study was about, but never mind, it's a better story. And of course, you can guess what happens by the time it gets to the Daily Mirror. We don't, why don't you university? <laughs> brain tumor. Which is so wrong, it's untrue. But what's happened here, the actual the story underneath isn't badly written. But the, the, the problem has arisen there in the press release and the person who writes the headline. So the first thing, of course, is to recognize that the person who writes the headline has got nothing to do with the person who wrote the story. They don't even speak to each other. The headline is there to attract clicks and attract views. So they can say anything they want in headlines. So I can give a whole story about you know, the problems with some of of writing headlines. So we've got all these distortions coming in at different stages. And it's important to understand that process. Um, and I, with my particular bugbear, is that a lot of this appears actually in the scientific literature. I, I, my, my, I reserve my greatest criticisms of all, apart from maybe some of the headline writers, for the scientists themselves. Because there is a huge proneness for scientists to exaggerate their work, to overclaim, to actually distort their findings. In order because, I won't say because they're in, it's not conflicts of interest like they're going to get money, but for their reputation and their et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, this is, you know, all to do, I think, with the replication crisis, the reproducibility crisis. So much of the scientific literature is not actually as good as it, as it would claim to be, for all sorts of reasons that we could go into about um, lack of protocols, about people just tweaking constantly, selective reporting, blah, 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 etc. And I'd just like to point out a particular example last week that really got to me. Um, uh, here's, a, here's, a, okay, here's a figure that appeared in a paper in the Journal of Public Health last week. Journal of Public Health. You know, what could be better than that? And this shows a reaction time. This is 14,000 people in the Biobank study, huge, meticulously done study. Reaction times in, in a task. And this is the daily dose of what you might call a food supplement. You may be able to guess what it is. Anyway, it's a daily dose in grams of a food supplement, showing improvements of reaction times down to this stage, and then going up. With the, with the lowest thing, this is on a log scale, but that, that dip is about 16 units. Okay. Have you guessed what the uh, exposure is? It's grams, grams of alcohol per day. <laughs> and 16 grams corresponds to in two English units. So there's two units, which is the current um, UK guidelines for maximum consumption. So you should check what the Norwegian guidelines are. But in the UK, they've been reduced down to two, two units a day. 16 grams a day is the current guidelines. So it, amazingly, what they showed is that the current guideline gives the optimum associated with the optimum reaction time. So, in other words, there's a big improvement in reaction times for drinking up to that level, and after that, a smaller thing. So, you might think the headline would be that, um, you know, drinking up to guidelines gets the best reaction times, <laughs> and drinking a whole lot more doesn't make much more difference. Okay. I get the feeling the researchers didn't want to say that. So, um, what they can, so you might conclude that. Okay, that's what you might conclude. They didn't conclude that in this paper in the Journal of Public Health. This is their, their study. They concluded that 
consuming more than one standard unit of alcohol per day is detrimental to cognitive performance. One, that's eight grams. And, uh, and they suggest, our findings have suggested to preserve cognitive performance, 10 grams a day is a more appropriate other limit. In other words, we should reduce the guidelines to improve cognitive performance. And it's the complete opposite of what their figure shows. So they're saying, no, we don't want to be here, we should reduce to here. Hang on, how's that going to help? And they, they have stuck to that claim that somehow this is where the harm starts. And the other argument, <laughs> their argument is that, they fit, and that their statistical model is has fitted a straight line here. And at this point, they chose to turn that, that straight line into a curve. So they say, oh, at that point, that's when harm is being done. It's like saying, if you're driving a car and benefit is going forwards and harm is going backwards, the harm starts when you start putting on the brakes. No. <laughs> that's hard to observe. That's a derivative, a gradient, not the absolute. So that's in the paper. They won't retract it. The editor won't retract it. But, you know, what happens? Huge, big newspaper coverage. When we get that, one pint a day can give you dementia. <laughs> the sun, boffins. You may not know the term boffin. Nobody, even in the UK, has used the term boffin since about 1948. It was the term given to sort of you know, the scientists in the Second World War developing radar. And I think it's only the Sun, the most popular newspaper, that keeps on using this language. So, and there we go. Drinking any more than a third of a pint a day impairs people's response time, the daily mail, blah, 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 coverage, coverage, coverage. Completely wrong story. You know, totally, totally wrong. So, I, that, I think that really upsets me. And actually, it very distorts it. And there is a general problem, I feel, that of, and this is something, you know, I, I don't know whether you, I'm sure you might wrestle with this, is that w when this, uh, people see that something's causing harm, less smoking or drinking or, or exercise, or no exercise, blah, 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 there's a tendency among some people to feel we can say almost what we like in order to get people to change. You know, the, the, I, I, what I feel is the sort of moral and ethical constraints of honesty uh, can be relaxed because we're doing the right thing, because we're telling the people the right thing to do. And I, it, again, it really upsets me when this happens in the um, UK, I talk about alcohol, I, I must admit a conflict of interest about alcohol. Um, it's not, the industry doesn't pay me, although I have been accused of that, I pay the industry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, let's, say, let's say I am a consumer, so, so um, uh, you know, a moderate consumer, and I, it, the, so I do, I, I must got to admit a personal interest in this. Um, so these new guidelines that came out last year, very good principles. People have a right to accurate information and clear advice. Everything I'm sure you'd sign up to. Provide this information in an open way so they can make informed choices. Yippee! Treating the public with respect. People make an informed choice. Tell them what the information, tell them the truth. Great. And, and this was the data <coughs> in, the, in the alcohol guidelines. Um, showing that uh, for men and women, this is chance of dying from your booze, and units of alcohol per week, and uh, for men and for women, showing some, some benefit, a small amount of benefit for a very low consumption, and where the lines cross. So they, they chose 14, um, uh, 14 units a week. Roughly, that's the point they chose. It's about a 1% risk that it would give you. So that low risk level, so that was chosen. This was the evidence base for choosing 14 units. Um, you know, so there's a whole lot of argument because it's the same for men and women now. It doesn't reveal the fact that above that it's much more dangerous for women than men. There's all sorts of other arguments, but that 14, which I think is you know, it's a reasonable thing to say. But look at those curves. And um, but then we get phrases like this. Drinking any level of alcohol regularly carries a health risk for anyone. Uh, no, that's not what the evidence showed, but that's what's claimed. And government warning any alcohol it raises your risk of cancer. And it's just on cancer, big emphasis on cancer, breast cancer risk from from drinking. This is government chief scientific advisor, and uh, the government um, chief medical officer who got into a lot of trouble, Sally Davis, who I know well, um, and, uh, but you know, she got into a lot of trouble because of the things she was saying. But this is the real problem with the Department of Health start doing their media communications. They say things like, men should not drink more than 14 units of alcohol each week. Hang on, this is supposed to be information from an informed choice. It's turned into a rule. You should not drink more than 14 units a week. And that, um, sorry, and that, uh, no, 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 no. Benefits of alcohol for better health only apply to women aged 55 and over. That's what they found. No, that's not, actually not what the review found. So clearly the people in the comms department, the Department of Health, feel they can say almost anything because they're on the side of right. And so they're going to, um, and 
And it, you, you just see that a lot, and I think, it, I think it's inappropriate. Why, and I, my backing for why that's inappropriate comes from this lady, who's one, she's Baroness Honora O'Neill. She's a philosopher of Kant, um, ex, you know, she's an academic at Cambridge. Um, she's wonderful, tiny little woman, frightening, terrifying. <laughs> I mean, I don't usually like TED Talks, but if you want to see something really inspiring, she's done a nine-minute TED Talk for TEDx Parliament on, on her. She studies trust, uh, you know, trust, trust, and, um, and it's all about trust. And in nine minutes, she managed to pack in Kant, you know, rules for trust, jokes, the lot. She's just brilliant. So really watch her talk. She says that we all want to be trusted. We as experts, you want to be trusted. We all like to be trusted. And she says, that's totally the wrong thing to do, painful. You should not aim to be trusted. <coughs> Trust is not something you demand from people, it's something you've given up to, given to you, if you are deserving of it. So she emphasizes all the time, you've got to demonstrate trustworthiness. So this is, she says, trust is the wrong language to use, it's trustworthiness. And this is, she says, an enormous impact in the UK. The Office of National Statistics, uh, the UK Stats Authority, and, um, and the Office of Stats Regulation, its number one criteria now under its sort of mission is trustworthiness. That is the crucial thing. Everything's now focused on trustworthiness. She's had an enormous impact. And she's great. So, and the other thing she says is that some different elements of being trustworthy. One element of being trustworthy is that people should be able to check your trustworthiness. You should be able to stand up for scrutiny. That means uh, opening yourself up, making yourself vulnerable to being questioned. There's a huge element of trustworthiness. Is not saying you've got to take my trust on trust. You've got to take, you've got to take me on trust. And so this, she's very good at her phrases. This is a lovely thing about transparency of information. So these are her phrases. It's got to be accessible, usable, and accessible. So cool. Except that people are going to be, people are going to be able to get at the information. It's got to be accessible. People are going to be understand it. And make use of it. And if they need to, they have to go to check it. It's got to be able to stand up for scrutiny. Wonderful rules. Really, you know, you can sort of threes, you can stick them and get them in your head. And this is the, I use these criteria now, whenever I get a public health message or anything, is this accessible, usable, and accessible? Can I check this? Will this stand up for people who want to, to, scru to, to scrutiny? So let's look at some public health messages that come out. This is a nice one. Bacon, ham, and sausages are the same cancer risk as cigarettes. <laughs> Oh dear. This is the, you know, the, the killer bacon sandwich story from a couple of years ago that came out of IARC, the WHO Cancer Agency. Terrible bit of risk communication. The worst risk communication I've seen. This is, this is the fact that uh, process meat, IARC do these um, monographs where they classify substances in terms of the evidence that it's carcinogenic. Not how carcinogenic it is. The evidence that it's carcinogenic. And um, can, then bacon, process meat has now gone into the same category. As cigarettes in terms of the evidence that it's carcinogenic. It says that's measuring its hazard, its potential for harm. It doesn't say anything about the actual risk, how harmful it is. So completely misunderstood, um, in spite of endless warnings they've had, I have had, about how people, nobody understands this, it's always badly reported. That's, that's the sort of story that comes out of this. And they tried to patch it up with new press releases. And you know, if you eventually f look at the bottom of the press release, they actually give the risk, rather than claiming that it's now, you know, definitely carcinogenic. And so this is the story. 50 grams of processed meat a day is associated with an 18% increased risk of getting bowel cancer. So that's the actual magnitude. Do we care? What's that mean? OK, 50 grams is a, you know, it's a bacon sandwich, a couple of sausages. 18% um, increased risk of bowel cancer. So, okay, that is a relative risk. I mean, many of you know all this. Right? But um, this is a relative risk of communication. It's, it's established by science, endless studies in psychology that this could be considered a manipulative frame for communicating risk. Relative risks doubles your risk, 50% extra, gives you a, a much more exaggerated feeling of the importance of the risk. Fine if you want to frighten people not fine if you want to inform them. So if you want to inform them, as to be honest, you've got to, you know, go and say, well, 80% of what? And IARC didn't tell us this, you have to go to another website to find out that 6% of people get bowel cancer anyway. So that's what's going to happen in the population. So what we're talking about is an 18% increase over 6 percentage points. Now, I know of no journalist who can do this calculation. Not a single one without help or, or, or advice. They, they know they should be doing it. 
because it's in the BBC guidelines, and they know they should be doing it, they cannot do it. They have to be told. And it's a lot of, you know, it still is not standard in epidemiological journals to give absolute risk measures. The other thing is not only to be able to do the calculations, but to tell the story about this. What does it mean? How important is it? And this is where this idea, which I not just me pushing, this idea of expected frequencies comes in. That you don't use percentages, you don't use charts, you don't use any of these ideas. You look at, say, what does it mean for 100 people? What does it mean? You actually have a, an image of a group of people. That's it. It's a concrete image that you can present to people, either visually or in their minds. What does it mean for 100 people? So there's 100 people, I don't know, like you, smug Norwegian, sitting down to your <laughs> worthy <laughs> breakfast and muesli and compote or whatever like that. And sadly, out of 100 people like you, still six will get um, a bowel cancer during their lifetime. Let's compare it with a hundred other people who sit down every morning for a great big greasy Brexit bacon sandwich. <laughs> That's how many will get bowel cancer. Do you notice the difference with that one? That, that is the 18% increase over the 6%. So that's a hundred people who have to eat that every day of their lives to get that one extra case. That's what technically is known as the number needed to eat. <laughs> I always wonder who's going to get that joke. <laughs> Requires a certain background to get that joke. But, um, so, uh, so that puts it in perspective. Now, this word perspective is very important. It is now an object of academic research, but this idea of putting numbers in perspective. There's some fantastic work being done by psychologists, actually at Microsoft, on how, what sort of analogies can you draw to be able to explain a billion to people, or a million, or one in a million chance. What, what sort of the stories? How can you embed this in an image that makes it more, makes it more comprehensible? So this is, a, again, an active area of research, is perspectives. Um, I should also say this idea of expected frequencies as a way of teaching probability is now, uh, some of us have managed to get this into the UK school's syllabus. It seems incredibly important, because if the journalists can't do this calculation, their kids should be able to. And we've even written a textbook now for teaching children, uh, teaching um, teachers how to teach probability using this idea of expected frequencies. And we're now producing a MOOC on, on teaching teachers how to teach probability. That's the first book that seems to be ever written on how to teach probability. That's extraordinary. So, and we've also written an app um, which should, um, you know, you can put the, your numbers in and it'll write, produce the graphs. You can scroll this up and make the graphs big. And it'll do this number needed to eat, number needed to treat for you, and write the text. So that to help journalists, whatever, press officers, or even doctors, explain these things. Okay. So, um, that, 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 yeah, that, this is old work in a way. I mean, this has been around for a long time in psychological literature. This is a good way to communicate stuff. Another application of where we use that <laughs> is in the new NHS breast screening leaflets. Actually, they're not there anymore. And I was on a group that drew these up. Um, breast screening is controversial. Uh, it was a deeply contested area in the UK. It no longer is because of these leaflets. It used to be very contested. Oh, papers in the British Medical Journal, books and forth. Oh, and there's all, you know, blah, 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 you know, pros and antis going at it. And it was finally decided to have new leaflets because the other ones have been considered rather manipulative in telling people to go, to go for screening. That would be based on consider the offer of having screening, it would present the pros and cons, allow women to make an informed choice, and not recommend that you have screening. So for the bowel, cervix, and, uh, and breast screening programs, the leaflets do not now recommend that you have screening. They say, well, you could do this, could do that. And the idea of presenting a uniform reporting of harms and benefits. User-centered design, a number of iterations, including a wonderful e episode with a citizen's jury. 25 women, poor things, had to sit there for two days. And now oncologists and designers talked to them. And I was a statistician, wheeled in to show them all the different ways the information could be presented. That's when I learned that a good table was so important, because I had to show them all these ways and say, which ones do you like? And bless them, they chose the ways I would have recommended. I wasn't allowed to say, I had to sort of pretend that. I didn't mind. Um, but I wanted them to choose expected frequencies. And they did. Cool. You know, so this is a, a page out of the leaflet. 100 women having a mammography. Four might need more tests, getting a recall. But it doesn't mean you've got cancer. Most people recalled don't have cancer. Whereas if you tell them the test is 90% accurate, which it is, in terms of sensitivity and specificity, it gives a totally misleading view. So that, that's actually you know, the right thing to show people. Um, and this is, again, a page out of the leaflet to show this is the balance. Breast screening could save my life, but it could lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment. 
it might lead to me being treated when I didn't need to be. Isn't that cool? It's in the picture. And these are the numbers that are in the leaflet. 200 women going for screening um, over, over 20 years. Um, uh, 15 would develop breast cancer. 12 be treated and survive. 80% survival rate. Very good. Three sadly will die early from their breast cancer. Let's do the bacon sandwich. And let's say these two, another, 200, another 200 women who don't go for screening, same number develop breast cancer, it doesn't prevent cancer. Eight will be treated and survive. Four will die from the breast cancer. These are the best estimates from the Lancet Review. But three will never know they've got breast cancer. So they've got it, but it's uh, DCIS or a form that's a bit slow growing, and they'll never know. So what happens is that these two, 200 women going for screening, one, in a sense, life saved, or early death prevented, at the cost of three unnecessary treatments. There's 4,000 women treated in the UK unnecessarily because of the breast cancer screening program. 1,300 lives saved. And those numbers are all in the leaflet. Quite extraordinary. The picture isn't in the leaflet. It got taken out. <laughs> to some of our annoyances, some of our annoyances. Because it is complicated. It's an expected frequency tree. It takes a while to explain. I can explain that to anybody. But if, you just, if you've never seen it before, and there it is, and it is quite true. And what that really proved to me is what I've been pushing for a long time, is that one size doesn't fit all. You have to have things respond to different levels of interest or knowledge or enthusiasm. Because it's what I call a numeracy paradox, is that the leaflets are written for people with you know, reading age of 11, that's the um, mm. standard, and a numeracy possibly even less. And, um, but those people, the low numeracy people, there's some evidence that they have less of an enthusiasm for engagement with the medical decision. So the paradox is the leaflets are written for people who don't want to read the leaflets. Uh, and it, it means that, you know, is anyone thinks that's so yeah. like easy? And so what that really, you know, convinced me that you can't, um, uh, one size doesn't fit all. You need to have multiple formats. You need to have people that, you know, allow people to get to the level and the detail that they want or don't want. It's like, I don't want to, just, I don't want to know Tell me what to do, Dr. Cross. Fine. So they want to do that. Okay, so um, just some final things on putting risks in perspective. I want to leave time for discussion. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I love these stories. You know, you, you just can't resist clickbait like that. You know, just uh, again, the, the, you're constantly trying to find a way of, of um, telling a story to provide an image, an image around it. This one's a bit naughty because this is such a stupid story. You know, why watching bins? And it all came down to some study on um, pulmonary embolism and hours watch, watch, spent watching television. And uh, this is a Japanese study. This is what it's all about. And you look at these people watching more than five hours a night. And this is how many pulmonary embolisms. And this is the patient years and this sort of thing. And when you finally get to this paper and you look at the data, you realize that 13 pulmonary embolisms and that many person years. That means even if this were true and causal, you'd have to watch more than five hours a night for 12,000 years <laughs> before you expect your pulmonary embolism. <laughs> which is what we say, at which point it probably comes as a relief. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a way of telling the story actually, yeah, actually, of course, sedentary behavior is very bad for you, but this study is not the one that, that shows it. Um, this is one, I don't know what you feel about this one. Um, I quite like this perspective, the, the effect of, of consumption. You know, 15 minutes off your life for a cigarette, 15 minutes off your life on average, you know, which, you know, which average over many people in many lifetimes is about right. So this was one, um, cups of coffee, uh, you know, multiple studies have shown, you know, uh, argued for a health benefit for coffee. Um, what it works out as is for a man, every cup of coffee on average put nine minutes on your life, for a woman three minutes on your life. Tuck in. <laughs> you, could, you, could, you could save this hour if you really shoved it down. Yeah. Up to three cups, up to three cups, only goes up to three cups. So that sort of storytelling, you know, a lot of people don't like because it's sort of playing a bit fast and loose with the, with the evidence of it. But it, it's very impressive. I think it's very powerful storytelling. Uh, and how much we want to do that, I'm not sure. Um, the other thing is, uh, that's the, the storytelling around numbers. The calling out. I, I also, as I've met, I like that part, I think it's really, really important that we police our colleagues, you know, our scientific colleagues. I really think that, you know, in an age of contested media, contested science, of, um, I don't think it is an age of fake news particularly, but, you know, of, of um, 
uh, but there are false claims around, it's a very, very diffuse media. Um, I think it's, it's important, we don't answer Trump by being more like Trump, even though some people are arguing we should be more like Trump. I, I just don't believe it. I think we should actually go try to be yet more reliable and trustworthy and humble. That's my personal mm -hmm. So that means calling out stuff that just isn't true. So here's another one. Toastgate, this became, this is the killer crispy burnt roast potato, which is a story in the UK last year. Um, this is acrylamide. You know, so again, in Sweden, there's a lot of stuff about acrylamide, dangers of, of crisps. Acrylamide. So acrylamide is this compound that accumulates on, on burnt toast or burnt roast potatoes. And at very high doses, it's shown to be carcinogenic, at industrial exposure levels of carcinogenic. Large numbers, eight study, large studies have done and found no association between normal um, uh, you know, consumption of acrylamide in our diet and cancer, increased cancer risk. No. However, Food Standards Agency in the UK in January the 23rd launched a campaign telling us not to burn our toast or our risk, risk potatoes. And we blogged about this um, quite strongly. And um, this is, you know, the. The toast was harmed in the making of this blog. So, um, and we were lucky because we get, um, I get quite a lot of news under embargo uh, from journalists and from the Science Media Centre. So we had the blog ready and, uh, and actually released to journalists before the story came out. So on the morning the story came out, I was on the morning new, main news program, the Today program in the UK, discussing this. I was on television at lunchtime. Um, two channels and things like that, and uh, arguing, saying this is a, a fake claim, it's a use of a phrase. You know, the, the adults with the highest consumption of acrylamide consume 160 times as much, and still only be at a level that toxicology are things unlikely to cause tumours in mice. <laughs> so, you know, that's sort of, um, you know, that's about 10 loaves of burnt toast a day, and you should still be <laughs> all right with it. So, this was really a, it was a, 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 a ludicrous public health campaign which can do nothing to help the reputation of public health campaigns. So, it's on the radio, on the television. And by 11 o'clock that morning, essentially the story had been, it was collapsed, had been destroyed, not just by me, but by others. And the campaign was essentially being withdrawn. And you know, this is the day of the mail. So the killer burnt toast story, and it was just a terrible public health campaign. It should never have started. Um, and, you know, I keep on going on the radio last week again saying these warnings to, or telling people not to do things are not cost free. It's not cost free because if you think it may be free and cheap to do, but in terms of reputation, in terms of public belief, in, in, in authority, in terms of, you know, it, it really is costly to do a fake and to do a false claim. Okay, so to finish off, yeah, finish now, um, this is my manifesto. Okay. These are things that could be done. First thing is treat audiences with respect. I know a number of people in this area who actually, I think, are pretty well content for the public. They think, oh, we can't tell them that. I've heard senior people say, oh, we can't admit uncertainty. And really, I've heard see a lot of contempt for audiences. Only make justified claims, acknowledging uncertainty, being honest with it. One size doesn't fit all, multi-layered communication, allowing for very little, blah, blah, blah. Use absolute risk of suspected frequency, so I've said all this, I hope. Putting numbers in perspective, that's an area of active research. Engage with media and press officers, you've got to take them really seriously. Take responsibility for that story. The storytelling is enormously important. And you should know what, how your story is going to be received. And aim for accessible, usable, and accessible evidence. And present risks to public and professionals in a transparent, tested way. This is an empirical science. We have now um, um, got a research program for ways of communicating uncertainty about facts and numbers and evidence without losing trust and credibility in the source. We're doing large online randomized trials of many thousands of people of different formats of language and <coughs> graphics and things that to communicate to say we don't know. How do you say you don't know? We don't know everything, don't mean we don't know anything, without losing trust and credibility. We're getting some results already. So this is an empirical science, um, and it, it relates very strongly to the work of the, the Uganda that's been coming from here, been carried out. Alan, and um, that, where, that, that we don't just communicate because we feel it's a good thing. We need to, this is an empirical science, we need to test everything that we do. Okay, and then just fine. we also need, um, yeah, these are the things, we need research on how audiences respond. This is the empirical science bit. You know, how do they, how do they respond to this? And we need education on critiquing claims based on data for schools, public professions. So, this is 
kind of work that I know since Jude's very involved in, and um, which I'd just like to, um, uh, yeah, to um, congratulate you for. Okay, so thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.